Good morning, dear saints, and blessed transfiguration, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today is Monday, February 12th, and you're listening to the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. In Deuteronomy 5, which is our topic for today, Moses delivers a dramatic encore of the Ten Commandments, directly linking Israel's future prosperity and divine favor to their adherence to these timeless laws. Set against the backdrop of their impending entry into the Promised Land, this chapter is not just a reminder, but it is a call to action. Moses' passionate plea serves as a powerful testament to the enduring importance of God's commandments. Folks, whether it's over the air, online at kfuo.org, or using the KFUO app on your phone, or maybe as a podcast or your smart speaker, oh, there are so many ways for you to tune in. It doesn't matter to me how you do it. I'm just glad you're here. You're the reason I'm here. So settle in, open your hearts and your minds. We're about to begin. As always, Thy Strong Word is graciously supported in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, and distributes books that are Bible-based, centered on Christ, and driven in the spirit of the Reformation. So when you get time, visit lhfmissions, that's plural, dot org. And if you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can always email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook. Just search for Phil Boo and uh, send me a friend request. Joining us this morning, though, is sort of just getting right to it. It's a returning guest, the Reverend Kevin Yoakum. He's the pastor of Christ the King Lutheran Church in sunny Riverview, Florida. Is it sunny down there in Riverview right now, brother? It's a beautiful day. I think we're going to have a high of 72 today. So oh, it's excellent. It's looking wonderful. <laughs> well, I have no reason to complain because I think we're going to be almost in the 50s. And for Southwest Minnesota, as you may know, that's practically spring. You know, we're walking around with <laughs> t-shirts and stuff. I love it. Absolutely love it. Well, it's great to have you back on the program. Today, we're going to be tackling, I guess, the Ten Commandments redux, right? Ten Commandments mm-hmm. 2, Electric Boogaloo, right? This is, this is he's coming <laughs> back and he's reiterating the commandments. Uh, I look forward to walking through those with you. Let's, uh, let's just start with some prayer. W- would you pray for us, brother? Absolutely. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you give us this time now to come to your word, to hear what you have given to us again and again, and to ponder and give thanks for what you have given us. Draw us back to your will and show us the mediator, the one who speaks your word to us, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, do you want to do any setting up for this or how do you want to get into it? You can just read. What's your plan? Well, as you said, this is the second time we get to hear the Ten Commandments given in the scriptures. They were originally given in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, But now as Moses is approaching the end of his career and his life and getting ready to send them into the promised land, uh, he is repeating uh, what they've already heard. And I always like the saying, anything worth saying once is worth saying twice. And uh, we really know this in, in a lot of ways in just our normal life that repetition has such a great value. You don't just say, I heard it once, I've got it. Uh, There's any number of ways in which we repeat things to learn. We repeat things uh, to give thanks. We repeat things to uh, rejoice or we repeat things to to scold someone. (laughs) Um, But so this repetition will be great. And we get to hear um, maybe even a few differences between Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20. But we get to hear the Ten Commandments today. And also uh, near the end, he gives also a great rationale. And even it's it's neat to hear uh, at the end of the chapter, God gives thanks for their proper fear of him uh, in what they've requested, a mediator between God and man. And I think that'll get us started here. Absolutely. And that comes up too, again, it just came up recently in the three-year lectionary about, you know, looking to have a, <laughs> to have a, uh, a Someone like uh, me from among your brothers. Sorry, I stumbled over that words. But, you know, as, as they go into the promised land, we know that Moses is going to be left behind. And so they're worried about that. And 
God reminds them through Moses that, well, you were afraid to come before God, so don't worry, there will be, there will be a mediator, uh, uh, someone like me from among your brothers that will be raised up. But yeah, we get to hear the Ten Commandments again. Uh, some people have also kind of described this as he elaborates a little bit or maybe a commentary on them, a reiteration. Um, that's why we hear some new information, but it's not as though the commandments have changed, just sort of getting that out of the way. Let's exactly. start with uh, chapter 5, verse 1. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. Yahweh our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did Yahweh make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. Yahweh spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between Yahweh and you at that time. To you, sorry, to declare to you the word of Yahweh. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain, he said. All right, here we go. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or is that in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Let's stop there at the end of verse 11. So we're coming in to, uh, you know, observe the Sabbath day, but we got a lot to work with right here. I mean, he, he brings this out and we have here um, a reiteration of you shall have no other gods before me and an explanation thereof about the carved images. Uh, I, I, I want you to start wherever you feel comfortable, but at some point I want to talk about why the carved image doesn't show up in our ordering of the commandments. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, this is a very uh, common question among Christians. Um, maybe not all of us realize that different uh, group, different tribes, different denominations number the commandments differently. And so uh, in, the, in the Roman Catholic and the Lutheran and uh, I think the Anglican tradition, um, the, the number of, of the commandments, the, the explanation about carved images uh, is understood to be part of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. That it is explaining no other gods, and so don't make statues, and so don't uh, worship or bow down to anything that is on the earth or anything that you have made. Because, uh, you know, the Lord says, I am a jealous God. So uh, this is, I think, the historic understanding of this among Christians is that verses 8 through 10 have been understood to be part of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. And then other traditions, I think, coming out of the Reformation uh, have separated that. And and it is really, in one sense, it's all there. And we haven't eliminated a commandment, as sometimes people go, why'd you get rid of those verses? And we didn't. <laughs> but uh, we just kind of grouped them together as part of the first um, this is interesting that in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, uh, you know, we are told these are the commandments and the scriptures will say they're the Ten Commandments, but they're not actually numbered. And so it's a judgment call as you read the text to say, is this the first or is this the, the, the second? And so different Christian traditions have kind of, you know, broken those apart in different ways. But we haven't uh, eliminated the understanding of that at all among any uh, Christian denomination or tradition. Now, I grew up with the uh, with the inclusion <coughs> of the third commandment. Um, ended up, uh, let's see here. We have, we have the first commandment: "You shall know other gods." And then the second commandment was: uh, "You shall not make for yourself any carved image." <clears throat> and then the third commandment would be: "Use the Lord's name in vain." <clears throat> Pardon me. So, one of the reasons why I guess I almost prefer that 
is A, because I brought up with it, but B, um, we split up coveting into like two. It just seems almost logical to have one thou shalt not covet at the end and then have that at the top. But as you said, the, the Bible talks about the 10 words, the Debarim of God. Um, it's all there. It doesn't really matter. In fact, um, one could argue that it, it doesn't necessarily even need to be 10, except 10 just represents that completeness of God's law. We could divide it up even further, I suppose, if we were so inclined. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, as I understand it, in the Jewish tradition, uh, the first statement, the first commandment is verse 6 where God identifies himself. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And, you know, that's a very interesting way of seeing it also, that the first statement is where God identifies himself, and then everything flows uh, from that. Um, and so, you know, how we might group these is, is a matter of choice or understanding or tradition. Um, and, and it does, uh, you know, I think everyone would agree that to split the covenant or the the covet commandments into two, it it may seem artificial, but I think it, you know. Speaking for us Lutherans, we're just doing what we've always done, and that's okay too. Okay, so let's keep on going. So as we look through the commandments here, at the very beginning, it talks about Moses summoning all of Israel. He brings them all together, and he talks about Yahweh our God making a covenant with us at Horeb, but. Then he reminds them that they were afraid, and then he starts to give them the commandments. So let's talk a little bit about this covenant, right? The giving of the laws at Sinai. And he even says, this wasn't for people before you, this was for you. And so obeying the laws was how Israel upheld their end of the contract, right? So let's talk about that. I mean, it almost seems as though as we go through this, he's going to be saying, Hey, if you keep the commandments, things are going to go swell with you. But we even know that not only can we not keep the commandments perfectly, but even when we strive, it seems like we almost get more persecution because we're living in a way that's contrary to the rest of the world. How do we wrestle with that? Oh, um, throughout the Old Testament, you know, God comes back to this in a few different ways. And it essentially waters down to, uh, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that sounds beautiful and wonderful uh, until we realize how hard it is to be the people of God at times and how hard it is uh, within our sinfulness to let uh, to recognize that God is our one true and only God. Um, and so it does seem as a conditional commandment, but it is that God will God calls us to this and God will keep his side. Uh, of of the covenant, but also this covenant is calling for us to follow in His will, and and therein is is the struggle as Christians, and, and therein also I, I would say is you know that struggle with our our society, uh, where uh, very often the society is not calling us to a philosophy or or to a worldview or to a, a pattern and behavior of life that is in keeping with God's will. And, and we have that, uh, that daily struggle of living in, in the covenant that God has put before us. So when he says, not with our fathers did Yahweh make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today, and talks about Yahweh speaking with you face to face at the mountain. These people that are going in, are, are they the same people that were there at the time? The same generation? Surely some people have died. Right. Oh, yeah. We, you get to see from Exodus to Deuteronomy how many people have died through, through disobedience. Uh, and, and yet here it is very interesting where he's saying this is not an old covenant that you're not part of. But he is calling them to be part of this covenant really from the day that they were born or, or maybe, you know, through, you know, the day that they were brought uh, to circumcision or something like that. But yeah, Moses speaking for God is, is saying, this is your covenant too. Not just with, with the fathers who came before you, but uh, God is expecting uh, all of Israel to be in this covenant. And, and so he has included them 
uh, with the whole people of God that were uh, alive at Sinai, at Horeb. Uh, he's expecting the Israel that's now basically standing at the Jordan River waiting to cross. He's expecting them to understand that this covenant uh, God has made and will keep with them too. And so pretty much everything that he said so far that we've read so far is pretty word for word from when it was given at Exodus. Uh, we're going to get some extra commentary in the next portion when it talks about the Sabbath day. But I want to linger just a little bit on the carved image. So when I was growing up, uh, I attended on occasion um, as a child a congregation where they had actually they rented a place from a Methodist church. But when it came time for them to go to worship, they would take down all the paintings and cover them up and there would be no musical instruments. And um, they believed they were very repristinationist. They, they felt like they needed to go back to exactly how the, the first century churches worship. But then they would add to that things like, well, no musical instruments. Or they would point to this and say, Things like crucifixes and even icons and paintings and um, really any of those things were, you know, verboten because of this commandment. And some, I think, ignorant of history, but still they might argue that the reason why we uh, uh, Lutherans and those Roman Catholics don't emphasize the carved image is because we love our carved images. <laughs> how would you how would you answer folks when they when they bring that up? Um, looking at just from an Old Testament point of view, um, I was also wondering, you know, how would they, someone with that uh, perspective understand that, uh, you know, the bronze serpent that they were to look on, and it was to be a visual representation of God's promise for them, and to look upon the bronze serpent and be healed, you know, which even Jesus uses in John 3 as a an example of God's promise to look on the the Son of Man who will be lifted up, or or to see all of the altar furnishings, the the tabernacle and temple furnishings, and the great beauty and care that God caused for them to have uh, to be made, so that people could see, you know, the Ark of the Covenant could see all of the the uh, decorations given for the temple and, and use those as also visual reminders of God, but they were not obviously, you know, facial representations or something like that. But I, I think one thing we have is, it is directing us to not see these visual representations as something to worship. And, and that seems to be the, the emphasis for verses eight through 10 here, that uh, these uh, things that might be made or things that might be found on earth. Verse 9, you shouldn't bow down to them or serve them. Uh, I would say our visual uh, representations, our paintings, our pictures, our statues, uh, they're not to be worshipped to, but they're to, in one sense, serve us as visual reminders of what God has has told us. You know, So we, we have pictures of Bible stories, pictures of Jesus in the Bible stories. They're to help us hear and see the story of God, the story of his promises through Christ. And then finally, I would kind of look to Colossians chapter 2, uh, where Colossians 2 says, uh, you know, do not do not let any of these things, uh, do not let anyone judge you because of your uh, new moons or festivals or anything, uh, you know, that was set down in, in the Old Testament as a a problem for the New Testament. You know, these things were given to bring us and to point us and to prepare us for Christ. And so I think, you know, Colossians 2 kind of uh, is a, a great standard statement, verses 16 and 17, to say that these Old Testament things were really to, to draw us and to prepare us to understand what Jesus Christ will do uh, when he comes into the world. I think that addresses it extremely well, and I typically will point to some of those same things, especially when, you know, if, if God gets to design his own worship space, well, let's look to where he designed it and look what he did. <laughs> he, it points to the grandeur and the glory of God through beauty. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Another one I've heard used and I've used myself is 
there's a big difference between something that points to or reminds you of your Savior and the thing itself. And, and you've already made that point about bowing down. You know, most of these same people will have pictures of their children, right? Huh, but none of exactly. them confuses the photograph of their child to be their child. So you might even look at it as you pray for your child. Let's say they're sick and you're not with them. And so you pray and maybe you have an image that you're looking at it. You're not praying that, that God would heal that photograph. You're praying it, it heals the person that's represented by that photograph. So I, I think the context changes too, because in that day, it took a lot of effort to fa It's so easy to make images of things now. It took so much effort back then, and they were contending with false religions where these idols represented the thrones of the gods or represented the god themselves in the sense that, you know, it was the god somehow contained within. Somehow that was where the god was residing. And, of course, gods, the true gods wanting them to not fall into that with him. And, and when we talked about, uh, let's see here, back in Exodus, when we speaking of giving the Ten Commandments, when we talked about that uh, worshiping the <laughs> golden calf, we even said, you know, there is some evidence to suggest that they were lifting the golden calf up as a, as an altar, as a throne to Yahweh, like some of the other pagan religions, and therein lied the issue. Not that they actually thought that little golden calf had had released them from Egypt when they said that, but rather they were trying to put God in a box, so to speak. Now, whether that's your interpretation or not, I think your explanation is point, you know, point is taken, and that is that we have all kinds of things that remind us because we are very incarnate, obviously, people. We, we want to be able to, to touch and taste and smell, and God condescends to that in ways all the time. He comes to us in simple water and simple bread and wine. So, so God condescends even to our need to be able to, to actually touch and taste and have corporeal reminders of his presence. Yeah, um, he, especially in the Old Testament, it, it's a very earthy way that, that God communicates his message to us. You know, the Old Testament is much more uh, understanding the people of the land, the people who work the soil, you know, people who uh, have uh, to, to deal with, you know, the, the, their crops and their livestock and even coming to worship, you know, they're they're not just coming to sit and sing. They're coming to offer blood sacrifices of the animals that they bring. Uh, it is going to be a very uh, sensory uh, 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 focused, I guess. Oh, that's not the right word, but you know that you God uses our senses also to understand uh, what He wants us to communicate, and so He is not just saying, you know, don't have anything that's a visual representation but he's saying don't, don't set up idols don't set up these things that would create for you something else to worship yeah let's move on let's go into verse 12 where we pick up with what we commonly call the third commandment observe the sabbath day to keep it holy as yahweh your god commanded you six days you shall labor and do all your work but on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and Yahweh your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahweh your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. I think that's worth stopping on its own at the end of verse 15. So we get a little extra commentary, so to speak, on the Sabbath day. And yeah, it's to be a day of rest, not just for you, but for everyone that you employ or live within your household or who are servant in servitude to you. Everyone needs to rest on that day. Uh, more confusion comes about, though, when people, you know, talk about Sabbath and uh, compare and contrast the Jewish keeping of the Sabbath on Saturday to the Christian custom on Sunday. And so probably a lot to remind people of there. It's, this is kind of ending up to be a little mini confirmation class here. 
Oh yeah, uh, we'll we'll shake and bake a confirmand in six hours here, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, this this observation of the Sabbath day, even before we get to the the you know what uh, the catechism, what Martin Luther might use to explain it. Uh, it sets forth a good pattern for life. And I just have to acknowledge that that even outside of worship, you know, verses 12 to, to 14, it's saying you're going to take time to rest. And God's calling you to rest as well. But really then in verse 15, kind of draws forth the idea that the Sabbath is not just for rest, but for worship. In verse 15, and so remember what God has done. Uh, remember that you were a slave, but God brought you freedom. And, and this is really one of the interesting points between Exodus and Deuteronomy. In Exodus, the Sabbath day is to remind us that he made us, he made all all things in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So in Exodus, it really points to creation. But here in Deuteronomy, it's pointing to the fact that God has brought them out of slavery to freedom. This reason given for the Sabbath in uh, Deuteronomy is uh, what you might say is redemption. And, and we don't really have to pick, oh, do I honor the Sabbath because of creation or because of redemption? We take both. Uh, we say, oh, God has created the world and he rested and therefore sets forth a good example for us. We do work and, and he's called us to take a day of rest. But then we also remember God has done good for us in such a way that we've been saved, we've been re redeemed, we've been brought free from slavery. And that brings, you know, so much of our Christian theology into this uh, from the Old Testament through Christ, that the Sabbath day is a day to remember how God has freed us through Christ from uh, our slavery to sin. And, and so the day of the Sabbath day being a day of rest is, is a great idea. And, uh, you know, would that we uh, understood that better, I think, in our society. And it's a day of worship. It's a day of remembering what God has done for us, not a day necessarily of doing more for God, but that, that it, it's a day of remembering God's service to us. Um, yeah, so then we do get into this, uh, what do we do today about the day of rest, about a Sabbath day as Christians? And you get to see it through that Saturday-Sunday struggle. Uh, but I think, again, uh, we see this as this was preparing us for Jesus Christ. A and the New Testament understanding of this and the Christian understanding is that the Sabbath, now that we have Christ, is not about what 24-hour period shall we observe. But the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. A and I love to to teach this and see people's eyes kind of pop open or, or to see their eyes, uh, you know, just really taking this in to say the Sabbath isn't Saturday or Sunday, but the Sabbath is Jesus. And there we find our full and complete rest. Uh, but also not to take away from the idea that our bodies need rest too. Well, to play the devil's advocate, then I guess I don't, if, if I find rest in Christ and I can find Christ everywhere, then there's no need to gather with other Christians in worship. We wouldn't claim that, of course. Of course not. <laughs> um, uh, many people have tried, haven't they? Um, <laughs> of I can find him out on the fishing, you know, fishing boat as yeah. much as I can find him in the sacrament, but that's not true. Right. Yeah, you can say, uh, you don't worship in the fishing boat, do you? You fish in the fishing boat. <laughs> um, and, and this would be another one where, uh, you know, from Old Testament to New Testament, that our, our worship is found where God's word is proclaimed. Our worship is found, our, our opportunities to gather in worship is found where God has put his name. And, and our worship is found where God's people gather together. So while there may be occasional times where we're unable to gather together as Christians, um, and, and we would say, I guess I'll have to have my personal devotion time, or I'll have to have, you know, just myself, I'm, those unavoidable uh, responsibilities, maybe of travel or work, sometimes those are just unavoidable, or, or because of sickness, or, uh, you know, down here, 
uh, many a uh, few years ago, after, um, about 15 years ago, we had to cancel worship because of a hurricane. And, and we we could not gather together safely uh, that day because uh, we just it wasn't safe to even go outside your house. And so we just told people, uh, read the Bible and pray. And that's the best we got today because uh, we, we wouldn't ask anyone to, to come out in the hurricane. Um, uh, but still, the, the regular pattern that God has set is that worship is taken uh, where his name is, where the word of God is proclaimed uh, in the New Testament, where the sacraments are observed and given, and where God's people gather. And, and really, we find that... Uh, seeing that fulfilled in Christ. And and so uh, maybe we don't have to say the commandment is a day anymore. It is fulfilled in Christ. Well, then we should find Christ and we should find where Christ gives his sacraments and we should find where Christ's people gather together around his name and around his word. Amen to that, right? Let's not neglect gathering together as the day draws near. There's still there's value yes. in that, and, and God gives us gifts in a very special way when we gather that you're not going to find anywhere else. But I'll tell you what, this is a good place to take a pause. So, dear listener, don't go anywhere. In just a few moments, when we return from our break, Pastor Yoakum and I will continue our discussion of Deuteronomy chapter 5 with the second table of the law. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Kevin Yoakum. He's the pastor of Christ the King Lutheran Church in Riverview, Florida. Don't forget, folks, that you can contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com. Be sure to spell it right. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Facebook with your comments, questions, and more. I'll listen to them all. Uh, if you send them to me while we're on the air, I can put them out on the air. Not today because we're pre-recorded, but uh, pretty soon we're going to be live about every day. But you can call in when we're live to 1-800-730-2727. All right, let's head on. Uh, back to the Bible. So the first, uh, the first table of the law is sort of our love toward God, and the second table is our love toward others. That's kind of how we divide it up for our catechumens and for our parishioners and for ourselves. We're going to pick up now with what we call the fourth commandment. And that's also verse 16. Honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All right, so pausing there again at the end of the commandments here. So, uh, you know, some these are all pretty self-explanatory if you've been in confirmation or even within a stone's throw of a church. But, you know, it's probably worth going through them anyway. Honor your father and your mother as Yahweh your God commanded you this we call the first commandment with a promise um, that your days may be long and it may go well with you in the land that Yahweh your God is giving you. How is honoring mom and dad going to make things go long, right? Make our days longer and make things go well. This is um, really, this is just the blessings of a peaceful life. And, and God is putting forth here that an easier and a, a more peaceful life happens when we can 
recognize God's gift of his authorities that he's put over us and how they are a blessing to us. So, you know, our father and our mother, they're our parents, they're our loving parents, in, well, usually, right? We'll hope. And um, they are God's gift really to provide for us and to establish uh, order and safety and security in our lives. And we understand this commandment to therefore extrapolate how we are to recognize all other authorities that God gives us. Um, this goes well for us and when we have learned to not fight with those things that are over us for our good, but to recognize them as a, a blessing and a gift from God. Uh, so, I mean, to, to put it this way is to not fight or buck the authorities, but to recognize and, and go go along with them and get well, uh, understand them. If, if a child uh, cannot recognize authority, even from his own parents, then it sometimes shows in how they can't recognize authority in school and they cannot recognize authority in, in the community. Uh, and they, their life is going to continue to be strife because they're, they're going to live in opposition to just the normal ways of, of structure and of authority in the world. And that authority is God's gift for us for, like I said, for peace and for security and for safety and for uh, learning the good things of life for, you know, for how to live. And if we can't honor our parents, uh, it'll extrapolate to every other authority and our days will be shortened. Uh, life will not go well with us if, if we cannot recognize God's gift. And, and, and so this is, God is putting before us uh, a more smooth way of life. You know, don't fight everybody that's trying to help you, that's trying to direct you, but learn from them, listen to them, and then honor them as a gift from God, that uh, they're there to, to bring us good, not just to, um, to stand over us as some sort of hindrance, but as a gift to provide structure to life. So when we talk about the Ten Commandments, you know, being the God's keys to a life with blessing, it's not as though that God's looking up there and saying, "Oh, oh, look, he obeyed his parents. Well, I think I'll tack on one more year to his life." And oh, oh, look, he was really nice about taking out the trash. You know, I think, yeah, I think I'll make maybe maybe tomorrow will be a real easy day for him. It's not like a throwing us a bone or pro bono. God simply saying. When you follow these ways, like he's, here's what I like to say. He's the manufacturer. He knows how we're supposed to be used, <laughs> um, how we're supposed to operate. And when we operate according to the manufacturer's design and instructions, then things just go better. It doesn't mean you won't have strife or you won't have enemies, but, but goodness, it, you're going to have problems if you live in complete um, uh, opposition to what he's designed you to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um and if we didn't heed the simple things of life that our parents would instruct us in, it's going to go poorly for us from the minute. You know, if they say, don't touch that stove, and we just decide we're going to disobey, it's going to hurt us. If they say, don't roll around in that poison ivy, and we decide, well, I don't have to listen to my parents, it's going to not go well for us. We're going to be so much hurt and bring so much suffering if we don't see that the, the authorities are speaking from our parents and others are trying to put forth a good and proper way of living for us. Indeed. Uh, what do we want to say about you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor? I mean, I just definitely don't necessarily want to go into what it would be a typical confirmation class, but maybe there's some people out there that haven't had confirmation. They, you know, how can we, I guess, in the short amount of time we have, unpack these these for them? Um, you know, at first glance, we might just kind of go, well, duh, uh, these kind of seem of like, of course, and yet we will find ourselves being tempted, maybe not to murder, but being tempted to not value life uh, and the gift of life in some ways. We may find ourselves, uh, it might seem kind of explanatory to not uh, sleep around and break faithfulness in marriage, uh, but we may find ourselves that temptation and to hear the rule laid out for us 
is good to kind of uh, paint the boundaries of life. Uh, we may not say it, of course, well, we might say, of course, we shouldn't steal, but we may find that temptation uh, to uh, grab something that doesn't belong to us, to uh, cheat on taxes, or, you know, however it is, to find, uh, think that we can grab some material profit from something that doesn't belong to us. Uh, so God puts these out as good boundaries. And like I said, they might seem self-evident, but repetition is a gift of God. And anything, anything worth saying is worth making clear and saying twice. Uh, but remind us, you know, this is a, this is a simple way for a good life. Don't do these things. But I, I want to give credit to uh, Professor Andrew Bartelt, one of my seminary professors. He said, I also see this as a future promise that in God's world, these things will not be done. You want to get a picture of what God's kingdom is? There's no murder. There's no uh, breaking faithfulness of relationships. Uh, there's uh, God, you know, there's respect for everyone's belongings. And it's it's not only saying, don't do this now. But it's also painting a picture of a future life where these things wouldn't even be considered in God's world. And what a beautiful uh, picture that is, too. Oh, yeah, it really is. I like that explanation for sure. And, you know, and we have this, you know, you won't murder. We argue today in the public square about what even consists of murder. But we forget the thought word and deed understanding, too, that... You know, we, we we can commit murder anytime we make someone's life not worth living. Adultery in all kinds of ways. Stealing is the same way. Bearing false witness. Now, that's a big one. And we talk about in Lutheran circles from Luther's catechism, putting the best construction on things. Um, sometimes that's not only difficult for us to do, but then we even debate on, well, how far does the best construction go before it just turns into actually bearing false witness in the opposite direction? Um, there's all kinds of ways where we look at these and we struggle to live them because we're so beset by sin. And that's why we find our rest because, boy, this is exhausting, right? This is exhausting to keep these things. We find our rest in Jesus knowing that he has kept them perfectly. doesn't mean we don't strive to live as God designs us or, as Bartelt says, as, as we'll be in the new heavens and the new earth. But still, yeah, we, we find difficulty in these things. Now, he's using some language that makes a lot more sense to them back then than to us, right? To field, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. When we recite this in worship, um, if we do, like for prayer and preaching, or we recite it with our kids in confirmation, um, it seems so <laughs> anachronistic to talk about not coveting your neighbor's ox and donkey. Um, I guess real quick before we move on, uh, how might we apply that in a more modern context? Um, we might see this as uh, you know, maybe breaking it down to simply not coveting your neighbor's people and not coveting your neighbor's stuff. You know, I don't have an ox and I don't know anybody who does. I, you know, I don't have a donkey or anybody who does. And, and I've never been able to have a servant. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, to see this as the, um, the general principle uh, of saying, you know, we are not to be, uh, it's not for us to be discontent with what God has given us. And it's not for us to try to ruin what God has given someone else. And, and so uh, the, our neighbor's people are his wife, for instance. It's not for us to try to uh, wish that we could have someone else's family. Uh, we have our own. <laughs> and it's not for us to wish that we could have the things that our neighbor has. Not that we might say, oh, he's got a, a nice house. I hope I can have one like that. But it, the desiring of that neighbor's own, that particular uh, field, I want to try to get those 80 acres away from him. No, it's not for us to scheme uh, in any way to try to get what our neighbor has. Uh, this is really uh, a commandment of coveting, uh, calling us to be content with what we have. And um, to not try to to seek, um, you know, it's it's about greed, I think, and it really starts to bring us uh, just circle right back around to the first commandment, because um, if we say I've 
I, I've respected my neighbor in all these other ways. Uh, this commandment of coveting is really looking inward. What about me? What about me? What can I get out of things? Uh, and it would draw us back to say, are you setting yourself up as your own God now and just wanting what you want? I think that's a perfect explanation. Anything else you want to talk about commandment specifically before we move into the next part? Uh, no, I don't have anything else that I uh, particularly want to uh, focus on here. The next part is pretty cool. Well, good. Well, in this next passage, po Moses is going to recount that scene from Exodus 20 where the people are reacting to having heard the Ten Commandments from Yahweh. So let's look at it. Starting with verse 22. These words Yahweh spoke to all your assembly at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added, No more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, Behold, Yahweh, our God, has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of Yahweh, our God, any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? Go near and hear all that Yahweh our God will say and speak to us. All that Yahweh our God will speak to you and we will hear and do it. All right. So the, the people are kind of, they're terrified of God's presence, but they're terrified because of this understanding that no one can see God and live. And yet they see Moses see and hear God and live. They contemplate the fact that they, in a way, have seen God and live. And, and the way I'm reading this is it seems like they're saying, well, you know, I, this is really is God. I, I want to hear more. I want to hear what he has to say. And, and so this is, this is where we get the giving of the commandments. But, you know, the people are eager for Moses to go up and receive these commandments, but not so eager for they themselves to do it. Yeah, this is um, really interesting. And God, in the next few verses, is going to commend them for their attitude uh, but I just want to point out, you know, as you study the scriptures, sometimes you look for repetitive words. And uh, in what we've read here, verses 22 to 27, the word fire is mentioned five times. You know, God is in the fire. He got speaking from the fire. And uh, it's almost you can see that they they appreciate and maybe, uh, you know, a word with terror, with with fear that God has come to them in fire, not in no, you know, not in a feather, you know, not in a sunshine, <laughs> but uh, in this great and terrible way, uh, in a way that really has grabbed their attention. That they are before a holy and righteous God, and they say, you know, we understand that we've seen God's glory and greatness, and we're still living, but we don't want to take that for granted. Now, Moses, we understand that. Uh, God has chosen to speak to you. You go, you go listen to God, hear everything he has to say, and you, you come back and you tell us everything that God wants us to know. And, and then, you know, in faith, they say at the verse, end of verse 27, we will hear and do it. And so they're speaking in faith, not just to say, well, I can't handle God, or not just to say, uh, God is your guy, Moses, not ours. That's not what they're saying. But they're, they're recognizing that Moses can be their mediator uh, to hear God's word and bring it back to them because they don't want to take God's holiness for granted. I think that's they understand that not, you know, God uh, has told them before that you cannot look in, on the, the holiness of God and live. But they get to see this now and, and they're saying, uh, we don't want to take this for granted. You, you go speak to God. We really want to hear everything he has to say. So you receive it and you bring it back to us. And, and we want to hear it and we want to live God's ways. You know, so they are speaking in faith, uh, even as they're speaking with uh, a good and proper uh, fear uh, of the righteousness of God before them. 
It definitely, to me, has a, you know, to whom else shall we go kind of feel to it, right? They're afraid of Yahweh because of his divinity and his might and, you know, just who he is. At the same time, they want to hear from him because of, because of who he is. It's, it's not, it, you know, it's not that they are afraid and say, well, we never want to hear from you again. It's like, well, you know, if, if Moses is able to endure this, then please tell Moses so that we can hear. And Moses picks up that mantle of being a prophet, verse 28 and following. And Yahweh heard your words, Moses said, when you spoke to me. And Yahweh said to me, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents, but you stand here by me and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as Yahweh your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that Yahweh your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess i that's the end of our chapter i love how god says oh i wish they always had this kind of passion and heart you know oh that they had such a heart as this always to fear me and keep my commandments the fear of the lord which one of my pet peeves is when we try to desensitize fear to the lord all the way down to just sort of a yeah, yeah, we, he's a good guy. We respect the Lord, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it, no, it, yes, all respect, that's great. But there is a fear that that they can be destroyed by this eternal God. And it is out of that fear that they learn to then those other things we say, respect and honor him. But, but fear is still part of it, uh, unless you want to nuance it. But that's kind of how I've always seen it. Well, I, I think we need to take that in uh, straightforward, uh, like you said. Uh, everything they that the people said uh, that they've seen the righteousness of God, and and they're a little afraid of it, and they want Moses to to be their go between. Uh, here, God is saying they get it, and this is a good thing that they they fear me in such a way that they really want everything I have to give them, but they don't want to take me for granted. I, maybe I'm paraphrasing too much i hope not that uh you know he says they are right in all that they have spoken i wish they always would continue this and you get a little hint there that god knows that uh we we will have our our moments where we have our clarity of understanding god and his promises and his will uh but then we'll have other moments where we just get it all wrong but here he's saying that at this point they understand that it is a good thing to fear the Lord and in such a way to desire everything he would give give to them and, and to live uh, with what he puts before them. And they say, we want to hear it. We want to hear it. We want to do it. This is, you know, they hear the Ten Commandments and they say, yeah, this is a this is good. Let's do it. Then he kind of gives them, you know, uh, in verse 29, he gives this acknowledgement uh, they're not always going to have this heart. He knows. He understands that. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, we could, you know, paint it uh, in many ways. But to, you know, the the heart of man is fickle, and it fails and it falters. Um, that uh, even as we want to do what's best, uh, sometimes we forget, or 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 we just are weak in the flesh, and, and we cannot fulfill uh, the right way of thinking, the right way of speaking the right way of doing and living in our lives. Well, we're here at the end of our time together. Any final thoughts you want to leave the people with, brother? Um, I just, verse 33, the last verse, uh, that he calls them to walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you. Uh, this is a theme that runs throughout the scriptures of to, to believe in God, to follow God, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, is portrayed as a walk, a walk that he puts before us, uh, and to follow that path. Uh, and, um, you know, this theme comes through uh, so many places 
uh, in the Old Testament and New. You know, and I'm right now I'm thinking of uh, the Psalm 119, your word is a light to my path. You know, that, the, that God's word has shown us the way in which we should walk, you know, and, and that God is saying here uh, that he wants us to walk this path. And he says that you may live and that you may go, it may go well with you. He does this. He puts forth his commandments, not to just ham, uh, hinder us, you know, and, and just to make another rule, more signs, uh, but no, that we may live and that it would be well with us and that we might live in the the land. Well, for them, you know, the land that we will possess, that we might live in the place that God puts us. Uh, this is, uh, these Ten Commandments are not just to be, uh, you know, so many people would kind of say, and it's just the crotchety way Christians want to live. No, uh, uh, no, it's not as if we're just trying to, you know, hamper all fun. That's not it. It's that this is, these commandments point a great life for us. In the first table, a great life with our God. And in the second table, a great life with our people, with our neighbors, with our families. I think that's a great way to end the program. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Kevin Yoakum. He's the pastor of Christ the King Lutheran Church in Riverview, Florida. Thanks, brother, for being on the show again. It was my pleasure. Tomorrow, folks, I'm joined by the Reverend Terry Yar, who will help us open up Deuteronomy 6. Now, that chapter features the Shema, emphasizing the importance of a deeply personal and comprehensive commitment to the one true God. The whole chapter instructs believers to keep his commandments ever present in their lives and to teach them to future generations and to remember them in every aspect of daily life. That and a lot more uh, when we come back. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high quality KFUO branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.